This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston in our neighborhood churches, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com. Good morning. Welcome to Mosaic Church. My name is Jan, one of the pastors here at Mosaic. And if you're new, if you're visiting, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, either through the physical connection card and the worship guide or the one on our website or in the app. With that said, would you please pray with me over the preaching of God's holy word. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are king. We thank you that you, the great king of the universe, came down in humility and took on flesh in the incarnation that you were born a baby, you were born a child. We thank you, Jesus, that you, fully God, fully man, lived a perfect life, the life that we should have lived but wouldn't because of our rebellious nature. And then you went to a cross. You hung on a tree, absorbing the curse that we deserve for our rebellion and also presenting a perfect sacrifice on behalf of us, absorbing the wrath of God that we deserved to be poured out on us. And we thank you, Jesus, that you died, that you were buried, that you rose and Because of the gospel, by grace through faith, through repentance, we can turn to you, ask for forgiveness, accept your grace, accept a reconciliation, and be drawn into a brand new family, a family of God redeemed through the blood of Christ. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that you died for rebels in order to change our hearts as we see you, the God of the universe, dying for our sins that melts our hearts. When we turn and we realize that you did that for us, to make us yours, to make us your children, to save us from your wrath. We pray, Lord, that you today remind us that you are king, that you can tell us what to do, and that we are called to accept your sacrifice as a savior, but also to follow you in obedience since you are our king. Jesus, we thank you for your first coming, and we long for that second coming. And in the meantime, let us do, by your Holy Spirit, the, the things you've called us to do, which is go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we pray all the, these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Well, happy Advent. Advent, we celebrate every year at Mosaic. It's the first, uh, it's the four Sundays prior to Christmas. We do it every year, but it feels more special this year to take four Sundays and meditate on Christmas. Why? Because Christmas is amazing and it should be longer. So for the next month, I'm going to be telling everybody Merry Christmas anytime I see you. Uh, The reason why we celebrate Advent is because uh, the church has historically celebrated it during the season. uh, As Lent is to Easter, Advent is to uh, Christmas. Uh, And the word Advent comes from the Latin adventus, which means coming. It's the coming of Jesus Christ. We remember the first coming of Christ, and we anticipate the second coming of Christ. We are to remember that he's come and that he will come. Jesus, uh, with communion, said, do this in remembrance of me. It's a reminder to remember Christ. Today, we're going to look at Matthew 1, 1 through 17, which is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And we're remembering Jesus by remembering those who brought Jesus into the world. And, and here is an important question that every single one of us needs to ask is, how will you be remembered? After you pass, what will you be remembered for? And then to clarify the question, you got to ask yourself, remembered by whom? By people or by God? Well, not many people have such an impact, such a profound impact on world history that they are remembered for generations. Uh, Many of us won't even be remembered 100 years from now, even by our own family. Case in point, what is the name of your great-grandfather? That's really good. Chicken wing. I, I, I think many of us struggle, unlike. For me, I had to ask my dad, it's Aya Vesico. That was my great grandfather. And if, if we ha- hardly many of us will be remembered by our family generations from now, uh, how many will us be remem- of us will be remembered by others? So that's, that's not even that important of a question because honestly, we're dead, we're gone. Who cares if someone remembers us? What really matters is how will God remember us? 
What will God remember us for, describe our life impact? And here today we have a list of people. We have a genealogy. It's a family tree of Jesus Christ, people who are remembered for bringing Christ into the world. And the genealogies seem pretty boring. Most of us probably skip this page in Scripture. Okay, what happened? What happens next? And not many of us are fans of genealogies or family trees, unless you uh, have ever done the Ancestry.com test or 23andMe. Uh, over 30 million people in the United States have. And congratulations, now the FBI and the NSA, they have your information. Uh, genealogy is uh, uh, kind of boring, but this genealogy is different. It's important. And this genealogy binds together the Old and the New Testaments. Why? Because this is the genealogy of a king, of a promised king. Here we have his lineage that he has the legal, regal right to the throne. And obviously this this genealogy is true. It's not fabricated because no one would fabricate a genealogy like this one. If you were presenting a Messiah, a king to the world, you wouldn't include some of the more scandalous people, examples. It's a, it's a family tree, but it's a very naughty family tree. We have in this family tree, we have adulterers and murderers. We have examples of incest and prostitution. And oddly, for Jewish gene genealogy, we have five women, three to four of them were Gentiles. So this is actually a story of Jesus' ancestors who were sinners. It's a, it's a family, but it's a dysfunctional family. And it's actually good news for us because many of us come from less than perfect families. Many of our families do have skeletons in the closet. And the good news of Jesus is that he is from a dysfunctional family and he redeems that family and he offers us a place in the new redeemed family. He welcomes us into it. So today we're in Matthew 1, 1 through 17. The words of the Lord given to his people after 400 years of silence. Would you look at the text with me? Matthew 1, 1 through 17. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. And Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nakshon, Nakshon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse. And Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph. And Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, Joram the father of Uzziah, Uzziah the father of Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz, Ahaz the father of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation of Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shiltiel, Shiltiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud, Abiud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim, Achim, the father of Eliud, Eliud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar the father of Mathen, Mathen the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation of Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. This is the reading of God's holy Inerrant, fallible, authoritative word. May you write these eternal truths upon our hearts. Six classes in Hebrew. Produce that. Praise God. <clears throat> Advent theology, three points we're going to cover today. Point number one, you will die. Point number two, you are a sinner. And point number three, you need a savior. It's a very jolly, merry Christmas message today. We're starting with death. <clears throat> Why? Because you will die. And this is a list that we just read of dead people. That's how the New Testament starts. All of us 
will die. All these people lived for a short time and they die. It doesn't matter how many vegetables you eat or how organic they are. It doesn't matter how much you exercise. It doesn't matter how pure your water is. It doesn't matter how many precautions you take. They all died. We will all die. The recent statistics say that 10 out of 10 people die. We all die. Ancient philosophers had this idea called the memento mori, to remind themselves that I need to remember that I will die. It's inevitable. We are mortal. And it's, it's good and healthy to meditate on this fact. We, we live in a culture that's very death averse, averse to talking about death. But it's good to think about it. It's good to visit cemeteries. It's, it's good to visit the graves of your loved ones or friends who have passed. Second century Christian writer Tertullian, he writes that uh, the ancient Roman generals coming back from victory, they would have a servant as they proceeded into the town, to the city, they had a servant stand behind them, holding the crown over their head, whispering, respice poste, hominem te memento, look after you and remember you're only a man. Look after the time that you pass. Remember that you are mortal. Life is short and shortly it will end. You will die. I will die. But we weren't meant to die. That's why we have such a problem with it. We have such a hard time accepting this reality. It's natural, but it isn't. Because we have an eternal soul. So the most important question before us every single day is... Where will my eternal soul, where will I, the real me, my essence, where will it spend eternity? And we're conditioned to always prepare for the next season. We see that with sports. We see that with education. We see that with careers. What's the next season? What's the next season? What's the, we see that with retirement. What about the most important season that is coming? And that's eternity. You will die why do you die? Because you're a sinner, and that's point two. Why are you going to die? Because of sin. We're all infected with sin. The infection fatality ratio of sin is 100%. Sin came into the world and through one man and death through sin. So what is sin? What is sin? We talk about sin often in church. We talk about it often uh, in, in community groups. It's in scripture all over the place. What is it? Not being or doing what God requires. Doing what God forbids, not doing what you're supposed to do and doing what you're not supposed to do as defined by whom? As defined by God, not by people, not by government, by God in his law, in his commandments. And it's rebellion against God to get rid of his commandments to say his commandments don't matter. It's like saying, God, I have my own rules. You don't get to tell me what to do. My life is my own. But God created everything. He created you. Every single heartbeat right now is a gift from God. Every breath is a gift from God. You, your body, your essence, your soul, everything about you is a gift. You are not your own. And God created everything, so he's sovereign over all. He gets to make the rules. He gets to, he gets to decide what he permits and what he prohibits. And there are lines that are not to be crossed. I remember when I was younger, I had to always know why God said something. Why is this good and this is evil? Why? And it always had to make sense to me. If it did not make sense to me, then I didn't have to follow it. I didn't have to submit to it. And if you do that, you make your mind God over God. And it's the same rebellion as Adam and Eve saying, it doesn't make sense to me that we can't eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's a forbidden fruit. But it's not just that. It's just an apple. It's not even an apple. It's a fruit. I don't know. I think it was a pomegranate. Who knows? It doesn't make sense to us. So we don't have to obey. Look, 
I, I think God, like if you look at the Old Testament, there's ceremonial laws about dietary stuff. We don't have to do that because Jesus fulfilled all of that. But I think God threw in some random stuff just to see if the people would submit. Don't eat shrimp. I don't want you to eat shrimp. That's it. Why not? I just don't want you to. Does God get to be God in your life even when it doesn't make sense to you? Because I'll tell you something, our desires, they control our sense. Our desires control our minds. That's why you bought all the stuff on Black Friday that you didn't need. I want this, I want this thing, that's it, I want it. I desire. God could just, God can do whatever he wants. That's the first thing that we need. And if you don't like that idea, that's showing, I'm exposing to you your own sin, your own rebellious nature, I don't like it. God could have said, thou shall not eat ice cream. No ice cream. And then you're like, oh. and he's like, okay, no premarital ice cream. No ice cream before you get married. And I define whom you have ice cream with by defining what marriage is. It's between one man and one woman for all of life. Before that, outside of that, no ice cream. No ice cream by yourself. No ice cream watching people eat ice cream. No ice cream with animals. No ice cream with children. Once you do get married to a person of the opposite gender, made a covenant commitment, you are actually commanded to have ice cream. Thou shall have a lot of ice cream. And if you fast from ice cream, make sure you don't fast for too long. That's in the Bible too. Does God get to tell you how to live your life in terms of the, 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 the strongest desires? Does God get to command your desires? And that brings me to a more important point. Sin isn't just what you do and what you don't do. Sin is deeper than that. Sin is deeper than actions, deeper than behavior, because we do what we love and our desires control our actions. Sin is placing yourself above God. Sin is saying, I am God. Therefore, I will do what I want to do. That's what Satan did. Scripture teaches that God is love. That's his essence. Therefore, when he gives us his law, the law flows out of his love. So actually, God's law is God's definition of how to love and the first commandment is, above all else, love God. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Only then you will be satisfied. And when you love God like that, he fills your heart with joy. He fills your heart with his presence, with his fullness. And sin is any feeling, thought, speech, action that flows out of a heart that doesn't love God above all things. And what's the penalty for that sin? Yes, the part of the penalty is consequences of sin and deep dissatisfaction, harm that we bring to ourselves and others. But ultimately, the penalty for sin is God's judgment, condemnation. Scripture talks about God's wrath. And every single person on this list, every single names that we just read, they all have something in common. They were sinners. Moments in their life, they loved something more than God and shirked God, tried to usurp his throne. And whether these people were relatively good or notoriously bad, <clears throat> they were all sinners in need of a savior. We're all sinners. We all transgress God's law. We all fall short of the glory of God. Everyone needs a savior. Even the godly Virgin Mary needed a savior. If she needed a savior, how much more do we need a savior? Luke 1, 46 through 47, Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. She looked to Jesus, the child, she said, you're my savior. She goes on to say in Luke 1, that through the one in her womb, God has remembered his mercy to Abraham and descendants. We all need mercy. Good people don't need mercy, but there's no one who is good. Not one of us, only Jesus Christ. And that's point three is you need a savior. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Verse one is the most important verse here. Verse 17 is the, the, the second most important. Their book ends to everything that happens in the middle. And the, the word for genealogy in the Greek 
uh, can be also translated Genesis. In the Greek it says biblos, geneseos. It's the same word to translate Genesis from the Hebrew into the Greek and the Septuagint. So Matthew is deliberately playing on words here. He's paralleling Genesis 1-1 in the beginning of the story, the, the Genesis, with the story of Jesus. Uh, he uses the same phrase, the same phrase is used in Genesis 5.1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made man in the likeness of God, the generations. So in the beginning, God spoke everything into creation by his word. In the new beginning, that's what Matthew is saying, in the new beginning, in the new Genesis, God sends his word to redeem that creation. It's a new beginning of God's ultimate work of redeeming a broken, bruised groaning creation. It's a new Genesis. It's a new beginning. It's a new Adam, a new head of humanity. God created Adam in the likeness of God, and then God himself comes, God incarnate in the likeness of man. And what's the difference? 1 Corinthians 15, 45 tells us, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. First Adam rebelled. The second Adam obeyed God in everything. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. Why? So that he can give us this life-giving spirit to transform us from the inside out, to take our hearts of rock and stone and numbness, our hearts desensitized to God by, by perversion, by sin, by pride, and Jesus comes and he reigns on earth primarily now through our hearts. That's what makes the new Adam so much more powerful as a life-giving spirit. Matthew 1, 1, the book of genealogy of Jesus. Jesus, it's Yeshua uh, or Joshua, which means Jehovah is salvation. Yahweh, God is salvation. That's his name. And that was highlighted in the birth narrative as the angel instructed uh, Joseph and Mary, Matthew 1, 21, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. That's the purpose for Jesus coming. Jesus came not just to make our lives a little better or bring a little cheer or consult us when we need it or provide therapy for us or listen to us when we need uh, an open ear. Jesus came to save us. 1 Timothy 1.15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost, says St. Paul. Matthew 1, 1, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ. What does Christ mean? Was it Jesus' last name? A lot of people think, yeah, Mary Christ and Joseph Christ, they got married, like, and then there's Jesus Christ. No, that's not what it means. Christ means the anointed one. That the anointed one that was promised in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament prophets and kings and priests were anointed. And what's important here is if you, <clears throat> there's two genealogies like this in the New Testament. There's Matthew 1, and then Luke has his own, and it's a little longer. And Luke traces it back to Adam because he's writing for a Gentile audience, a Greek audience. And Matthew locates Jesus firmly in the story of God's relationship with the people of Israel because he's writing to Hebrew people, Jewish people. And the point is that he wants to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises that God gave to the people of Israel. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah, which is emphasized again in verses 16 and 17. Jesus is the culmination of God's redemptive work. Everything that came before Jesus reaches its climax, its pinnacle, its perfection in Jesus. He is the ultimate prophet. There were prophets in the Old Testament, the greatest of which was Moses. But Moses said, I'm going to send a lawgiver. Uh, God's going to send a lawgiver greater than me because I can't produce obedience. I can tell you what's right and what's wrong, Mo but Moses could not produce it from the inside out. There will be a greater prophet who transforms hearts. Deuteronomy 18, 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, says Moses, from among you, from your brothers, it is to him you shall listen. He's a greater prophet than Moses. He's also a greater king than any other king, a, knee, a king that, to whom every knee shall bow. He's also the greatest priest who offers not the blood of bulls and goats, but offers his own blood at the cross of Calvary. 
Matthew 1, 1, the book of genealogy, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Why are these two highlighted here when they're going to be mentioned later? The reason is that God gave very particular promises about the Messiah coming to both Abraham and David. God promised to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. From you, Abraham, I'm going to send a descendant that will, will offer blessing to everybody. And then Genesis 22, the context is this is where Abraham is bringing his son Isaac in sacrifice because God was testing whether Abraham fears God and loves God. And Abraham was obeying God. Angel stops him. And God at that moment sends the promise again. The angel says in Genesis 22, 15, and the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven, as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring, singular, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. St. Paul, the great theologian that he was, inspired by the Holy Spirit, points to this text in Galatians, and he says, now the promises were made, Galatians 3.16, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. God promised to Abraham, I will send a Messiah who will, send, who will save all of those who turn from sin to him, and he will come from you. And God made that promise to Abraham. He also made a promise to King David that on his throne he will have a descendant that will rule forever. Psalm 132, 11, the Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. And then 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 14, A, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom and he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his king, of his kingdom forever. And I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son forever. Well, David died and Solomon died and every single one of the kings after died. How can this descendant rule forever? It, had to be, it has to be a, a, a descendant who overcomes death. And then the promise is expanded in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David, over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So Abraham represents that Jesus Christ is part of the people of Israel. David represents the hope of the future kingdom. The line of Abraham places Jesus in the nation. The line of David puts him on the throne. Why is all of this important? It's because for, the, for centuries, in the Old Testament, for centuries, the Jewish people hoped and they hoped and they longed and they longed. God, when will you fulfill your promises? And then there were four, 400 years of silence. God, why are, you, why are you so slow in keeping your promises? And Jesus finally comes, and he's a fulfillment of Israel's hopes for restoration of her kingdom. And Jesus is ultimately uh, the culmination of all of our hopes. And it is important to note that Jesus is Jewish. My, my daughter Elizabeth, this, I, I said, did you know Jesus was Jewish? I had no idea. I thought Jesus was Christian. Jesus was Jewish. This is important to know. And the Old Testament was important. His lineage comes from the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through a royal line of King David. And that's why Matthew, I don't know if you 
if you study this chapter, that's why the number 14 is so important here. He gives us three sets of 14 generations. And, and why does he do this? If you actually look at the history, he's omitting four kings who were cursed in the Old Testament from the second section. But Matthew presents this section because the number 14 highlights the numeric value of David. D, uh, in, in Hebrew, they didn't have uh, vowel points originally, so th- and, and every single consonant had a numeric value. The D is four, the W is six, and D, David, D, W, and then D again, four, six, four, it's 14. It's to show us, to highlight the fact that Jesus isn't just a savior. He's a savior who is a king. This is crucial. A lot of people want Jesus as my savior to save me from sins so that I can sin again. And then you just keep coming back. Okay, God dirty. Okay, save me. Okay, God dirty. Okay, save me. Jesus is also king who gets to tell us what to do. The reason why he's offering us salvation is because we didn't do what he said to do in the very beginning. So I'm going to save you from that condemnation, but also repentance is turning to the king. Jesus, I want to submit. It's hard. I, I, I struggle. I need more grace, but I do. I long to follow you, Jesus, the king. And Jesus is the son of David who is king. He's the mighty warrior king who has come to defeat our ultimate oppressors. In the first century, if you read the Gospels, the first century Jews who knew the Old Testament, they, they, they couldn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They're, they're expecting this great political king, this great king to come on, on a stallion and destroy the Roman Empire. And yet the king comes as a suffering servant of Isaiah 53. They couldn't reconcile Isaiah Isaiah 9 and the promises of this king who the government would rest on his shoulders with Isaiah 53. Jesus was the king, but not the king that they had expected at that time. Jesus asked, Jesus standing before Pilate, Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, it is as you say. The mocking soldiers jeered at Jesus when he was on the cross, hail king of the Jews. Words nailed on the top of the cross, this is Jesus, the king of of the Jews. The only way that Jesus, the mighty warrior king, could come and offer us ultimate salvation is to defeat our ultimate ultimate enemies. And our ultimate enemies aren't political. Our ultimate enemies are sin, Satan, and death. And Jesus Christ comes, the king of the universe, and he's crucified by people. Why? What is he doing there? What's going on on the cross of Jesus Christ? It's not just a Jewish rabbi getting executed in excruciating pain, capital punishment by the Roman Empire to humiliate him. That's not just what's going on. Jesus is God and he allowed this to happen. Why did God allow this to happen? Why did God the Father allow God the Son to die on a cross? Because Jesus Christ was at that moment paying the penalty for our sin. Bearing the weight of our condemnation, God's wrath was being poured out on him. That's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God God turns from Christ. God the Father turns from him. Because God is holy, and Christ at that moment became our sin. And he died, and he was buried, and he rose on the third day as proof that the sacrifice was accepted. God promised in the very beginning the seed of the woman would come crush the head of the serpent in Genesis. The promise was expanded to Abraham that through his descendants all the nations would be blessed. The promise was repeated to Isaac and Jacob and Judah. The promise extended to King David that one of your descendants will be on, enthroned forever. The promise expanded again through Isaiah to include that. It will come through, he will come through a virgin birth. The promise expanded by Micah to describe the place of that birth, which is Bethlehem. And God kept his word. That's the point of, Je- of Matthew 1. God kept his word, sent his long-promised Messiah, who is the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, and the seed of David. And why is this good news? It's good news because we're sinners, and finally a Savior has come, offering us overwhelming grace. And we see grace that's given to all these people in this list, Matthew 1, 2 through 6. I won't won't hit all of them, but I I just want to point out two things. God pours out his affection on these people through election. He chooses them, not because of anything in themselves. You look at Abraham. 
Abraham was a great guy for the most part, but he also was a coward a couple times. He goes to the land of the Philistines and he's afraid, apparently his wife was really good looking, and he was afraid that they would kill him and marry his wife. So he said, baby, let's take off our wedding rings and I'll tell everyone that you're my sister, which is terrible. It's, that's terrible. That's like, bro, take one for the team, man. If you're going to go, you're going to go. Like, put up a good fight. You can't do that. He doesn't just do that once. I can't believe Sarah forgave him, by the way. Sarah, she must have been a great wife. She forgives him, and then he does it again. He's a liar. His son, Isaac, does the same thing. Goes to this land. Apparently, his wife is really good looking. He did this thing. He's like, baby, let's just tell me you're my sister. Liar. Then they have a kid, Jacob, also a liar. Lies to his dad that I'm, I'm Esau, the firstborn liar. He's a sinner. Judah. Oh, we got to get into this guy. Okay, let's get into this guy. Judah, who's connected to Tamar, and there are, there's four women here. We'll go through this whole section. There's Tamar, there's Rahab, there's Ruth, there's Bathsheba, and we know the first three are definitely Gentiles, Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth. Bathsheba was married to a Hittite who also was a Gentile. So maybe, at least by marriage, she was also a Gentile. So the story of Judah and Tamar is one of the most scandalous stories in all of Scripture. And it's there because it happened. So this is Genesis 38. Judah had three sons with a Canaanite woman. The first son marries Tamar, also a Canaanite woman. And the first son, heir was so evil that God kills him. But according to the, the tradition of the Torah, you had to con continue. If there were brothers and your, your, one of your brothers died, you had to marry his wife in order to continue the family name. And, and so his second, the second son marries, his second son was supposed to marry Tamar, conceive an heir for his brother, dodges his responsibility, was fine sleeping with Tamar, not marrying her, just wanted to use her instead of serving her, didn't fulfill his responsibility, so God kills him as well. And Judah promised Tamar that the third son would grow up, would marry her. He either forgot or he ignored the promise, and Tamar gets mad and just disguises herself as a prostitute and then sleeps with Judah. And then she gets pregnant, and Judah, in one of the most egregious acts of hypocrisy in Scripture, he says, oh, she sinned, we need to you know, punish her, etc. And then she's like, hey, by the way, you know, Jerry Springer, surprise, let's take a paternity test, you're the dad. And the grandpa, which is very sordid, like cue the country, I don't know what's going on here. And this is in the Bible. And this is one of the ancestors of Jesus Christ. And then there's Rahab, who was a prostitute. She distinguishes herself by faith and converts. There's Ruth, who was a Moabite. And the Moabites were people who descended from Lot's incest with his daughters. And then there's Bathsheba, who sins with King David. But those aren't even the worst sinners. The worst sinners were Judah. And then the ultimate king, King David, who was a murderer and an adulterer, and he did a lot of other stuff too. So the point of this, why is Matthew writing this to the Jewish people? Why? Why include these painful points from their genealogy, from their story? It's to humble a proud people. You think you're so great. You think you descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You think you need grace. No one, not even the greatest, doesn't need the grace of Jesus Christ. And no one, not even the worst, can fail to receive the grace of Jesus Christ. Every saint has a past, and every sinner has a future, thanks to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ comes in order to redeem. And, and this, the, uh, one of the great lessons that we can draw from this whole story is that God is so good that he can take our greatest evil and redeem it and use it for good. So, ha and, and by the way, the, like the most sordid stuff here is all sexual sin. Why? Because that is, that's one of the biggest idols of our lives. It, it, it's not just today, it's always been the case. That's why this is in the story of Jesus Christ. So have you committed sin? All kind, what kind of sin? Like, get specific. Have you committed premarital 
sex, sin, fornication, adultery. Have you had children out of wedlock? These are all sins. Addiction to porn, these are all sins. Sins that take, they take control of your heart and they, they push God out. And also these people, they are sinners, but they testify to grace. That when you turn to God, you repent of, of sin and you cry out to God, Lord, you are Lord. Lead me in the ways of righteousness. And God does forgive, and he brings us into his family. Galatians 3, 28 and 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The other thing I want to point out is Matthew 1, 16. So the formula has been so-and-so is the father of so-and-so, so-and-so is the father of so-and-so. Why is that important? Well, because dads are important. We live in a culture that pushes against that. Like, we got to get rid of the patriarch. No, dads are important. Dads are crucial. Crucial to children's development, but also their spiritual lives. So if you are a father, you are called to disciple your child, to raise them up in the faith. Dads are crucial to be present, to bless their kids with words from, uh, from truth and also a walk uh, of truth, uh, but the pattern changes. Jacob, the father of verse 16, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called Christ. So now we're not talking about Joseph, we're talking about Mary, whom is feminine in the Greek. So Joseph's not the physical father of Jesus Christ. Why is this important? Well, if Jesus had been the physical descendant of Joseph, then he would have been barred from the throne of David by the curse on Jeconiah. This is Jeremiah 22:30. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not succeed in his days, for none of his offspring shall succeed in sitting on the throne of David and ruling against Judah. So only because of the virgin birth, Jesus escapes the consequences of that curse. So Jesus doesn't descend physically from Jeconiah, but remains the legal heir. And in this, you see God's overruling sovereignty, that he takes the curse and he circumnavigates it, overrules the curse and turns it into a blessing, just like he did with the cross of Jesus Christ. Christ on the cross, the cross in, in the Old Testament is called the tree. Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Here we have the family tree of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to hang on a tree, bearing our curse, and that curse was flipped. God turns the ultimate curse into a blessing. It's blessing for us because he became sin for us so that we might become his righteousness. And at the greatest moment of the despair, when all seem lost, God's son dies. Well, he dies in order to come back from the dead in order to give us the greatest blessing that there is. What are these numbers all about in Matthew 1, 17? So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. What's going on here? Three sets of 14. The first 14 is two sevens, one, two. The next 14 is two more sevens, three, four. The next 14 is two more sevens, and you get five, six. And then Jesus Christ comes as the seventh seven. It's to show us that Jesus Christ is the ultimate Sabbath. God Sabbathed on the seventh day. Every seven years, the land of Israel is supposed to rest, lie fallow so it could replenish its nutrients. The year of Jubilee was every 49 years, seventh, seven year. What happens in the year of Jubilee? All debts are forgiven. All slaves are freed. Jesus Christ is our seventh seven. That we can find our rest, our satisfaction, our blessing in him. We can take rest in the fact that Jesus redeems us slaves to sin. And he pays our debts. And that we can find the deepest longings of our souls fulfilled in him. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, the words of Christ, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is, is light. The only thing that these people are known for other than sin 
the reason why they're included in, in this text, they're remembered for bringing Jesus Christ into the world. Part of the marching orders that we can never forget as Christians, we have been given marching orders from our king. And the marching orders before Christ ascends to heaven after his resurrection, he gives in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Let's not forget, Christians, our marching orders. Let's not forget that Jesus is king. And also, if you're not a Christian, if you're not part of the family of God, or you're just not sure, Jesus welcomes you into his family. He came from this sort of dysfunctional family to redeem it, and then he offers that redemption to us. He, kn he knows those people by name as he knows us by name. It's a list of people who are imperfect, people who have sinned, people who have rebelled, but people who have been redeemed because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So no matter what you've done, no matter what your family history is, no matter your sins that you've committed, come to Jesus. Join his family. We do that through repentance and faith in Christ. Lord, forgive me, I have sinned. I am a sinner by nature and choice. Please give me your grace. Please give me your forgiveness. I want to follow you. Give me the Holy Spirit. Just ask for it. He gives it to you. And after you become a Christian, we lead a, a daily life of following King Jesus, taking up our cross, following him. Do we do it perfectly? Of course not. We're still sinners. We still need Jesus. Praise God for him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your first advent. We thank you for your first coming. And we pray, Lord, for that second coming. But until we're there or until we pass from this life to the next, Lord, give us the power of the Spirit to follow you on a daily basis. To follow you as faithfully as we can. And when we are not faithful, you are, when we are faithless, you are faithful. And you give us more grace and pick us up and continue to lead us in the ways of righteousness. Lord, continue to bless each one of us and bless us in this incredible season of Advent. We thank you for it, and we thank you for the gospel, and we thank you for Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.